like that went smoothly. All right. Well, uh, welcome to Quick Pass, everybody. Uh, Quick Pass Spring 2024. Uh, my name is Aaron Wood. Uh, this is the second Quick Pass cohort. And um, a little bit about me. I retired out of the Air Force in uh, 2020, right at the start of the pandemic. That was fun. And uh, I went through COVID platoon myself. So uh, after serving 21 years uh, in meteorology, I decided to switch over to software engineering. And uh, since then, I've been uh, uh, jumping from uh, basically a job to job about every year, two years. Uh, I think I finally settled on something, which is uh, back with Air Force weather. So uh, doing software development for them. Um, I am healing from the St. Louis area. So I retired out of uh, Scott Air Force Base and uh, settled here. Uh, and so that's where I'm at. Um, with me are, are a few folks from uh, Co Platoon. Um, we have uh, Gregory Drogny, uh, as well as Tish Johnson. And um, we also have uh, Catherine Burns, and then also uh, Nick Smith. Um, would you guys like to introduce yourselves? We can start with Greg. Yeah, we can go in that order. That's fine. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Greg Drobny. For those of you, uh, I've sp spoken with a lot of you already. I recognize a lot of names. Some of you I've spoken several times with. Chad, looking at you in your direction for, uh, you know, my one of my favorite podcast guests. Um, but I'm the student recruitment and outreach manager for Code Platoon, usually the first person who people talk to when they come to Code Platoon, also kind of the resident skill bridge expert. So if any of you are skill bridge, you'll definitely be talking to me. Uh, but I'm here to help answer any questions about the kind of the application process, enrollment process, all of that. Tish is going to be the enrollment expert. She's the guru. I'm more of a generalist. So I'll hand it over to Tish. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, again, my name is Tish Johnson, and I am the Student Support and Compliance Manager with Code Platoon. I've been working with Code Platoon for about two years now, and um, I will be helping you with all of your questions related to funding, scholarships, VA benefits, all that good stuff. So I look forward to speaking with you and going into detail, and um, I'm in the Philadelphia area. So nice to meet you all. I'll go next. Uh, I'm Catherine Burns. I'm the Career Services Coordinator. My um, co-colleague, uh, Rich Luby, couldn't be here tonight, but the two of us will work with you, not at the beginning, but at the end, when you, if you come on and join a cohort, when you finish your coursework, we are the Career Services team, and we will help you in your search for an entry-level tech job, but I can talk more about that later. Uh, I guess that means it's my turn. Hey, uh, everyone. My name is Nick Smith. I'm the Code Platoon Program Manager. I help manage the uh, in-person and evening and weekend cohorts for all of Code Platoon. So if you have questions about the classroom or instructors or things like that, you can reach out to me. Uh, and I'm available to help with anything. I also do all the admin stuff in the background. Uh, we use Google. We use Slack. We use a bunch of systems and stuff. And I'm the guy that controls all the keys. So uh, if you need anything from me, let me know. Awesome. Um, so a bit of a bit of background on this course. Um, so if if you don't have access to anything, please let us know either here or in Slack. Um, Slack is our primary form of communication when we're not in a Zoom room. So you know, please, I, we encourage the channel to be active. Um, I have some some quick links at the top of the of the uh, Slack channel, uh, as well as a link to the GitHub, which has the entire course. Uh, laid out for you, uh, where you can go on and access material. Um, so if you haven't accessed that yet, uh, you still have time. Uh, you don't even have to access the material right away because uh, I'll be showing everything on my screen uh, through the sessions. But if you if you'd like to access it and actually try it along with your coding, you can. Um, before we get started with Copa Two material, though, um, the reason we have uh, most of our Copa Two guests on uh, is because they're going to. You know, they're going to present some stuff uh, for about the first hour. We're going to go over uh, their programs and how they can help you uh, should you, you know, get into Code Platoon and also what what uh, what we have for uh, uh, what we have to, to help you uh, go through the program and also get a job, you know, in your new career field. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll pass it on to to Greg to start. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. I mean, like I said at the beginning, I'm I'm the student recruitment manager, so I'm just kind of here to answer basic questions about how you get into this process. For the most part, you're already here. So the there's not a lot of expertise I'm going to offer you that isn't going to be better addressed by someone else. But, and this is what I will say as a caveat to that, I am here to help you walk through this process. So having me as a contact, in fact, I'm going to put my email in the, in the chat. Um, and for just a, a reference, uh, all of our emails are super easy because they're all of our first names at codeplatoon.org. So if you have trouble remembering anybody's email, just think of their first name and you're good to go. But I'm here to help kind of facilitate connections and communication between these different pieces and parts yeah. and answer just basic questions. But uh, I, I defer to, like I said, to Tish in terms of the uh, the specifics of enrollment scholarships, that's going to be her department. I'll, obviously, Catherine's here for career services. I am here, though, for SkillBridge. If any of you are SkillBridge, I will offer this. Um, the bottom line for SkillBridge, if any of you are, if you don't know what SkillBridge is, you're not in it. Don't worry. That's for active duty people who are transitioning out of the military, who are still in the service and are going to do this program in the last 180 days of service. If you're SkillBridge, the bottom line that I need from you to attend Code Platoon, not to be accepted, but to attend Code Platoon is a command approval. Some type of documentation from your chain of command that says, yes, this person can attend from X date to Y date, whatever that cohort date is. That's really all I need. What that looks like is different in the Army. It's different in the Navy. It's different in the Marines. It's different in the Air Force. Every service branch has a little bit different documentation. So if you have any questions about that, please email me. We'll work on getting it. But again, we only need that for you to attend. So if you have it, this isn't ideal, but if you can't get it right away and you can't get it till right before the cohort starts, we can work with that if, you know, we can do it. We would prefer to have it sooner than that, as Tish will certainly attest, <laughs> but we we can do it if you get it that day before. I've even gotten it on the morning of class starting. So uh, are there any questions specific to SkillBridge before I hand us off to anybody else? Um, I do have a question. So if I just got my SkillBridge or my um, DOS moved up and maybe I don't fit the exact dates for a cohort, are the chances of me being accepted like limited or how does that work? So with all things SkillBridge, we are flexible on our end. So if your date, so your 180-day window doesn't line up exactly with a cohort, we we don't mind. That's okay. Where that becomes tricky is whether or not your command cares. Some commands say, oh, it's not a big deal. This, you know, this person is on the outside of that 180 days, and so they won't let them. And other commands say, no, nah, it's not a big deal, because it is truly up to the individual command whether or not to sign off on you attending. It's, it's under their purview to say, yeah, it's okay. So really what it comes down to is whether or not your command will approve of it, because on our end, that's perfectly fine. One more question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, so my command is requiring that I have a training plan of sorts before they give approval. And I think that's across the board, but I know my commander specifically was like, yeah, you can do it. I just need a training plan, like a breakdown of what I'll be doing. So how do I go about getting that so that I could submit it to get approval? Email me and my forgetful mind so that I don't forget that you need a training plan and I will get it for you. Between Nick and I, we will we will get that for you if I don't have it already. Any other skill bridge specific questions? Tish, anything you want to add? Anything I said wrong? You can um actually me. That's okay. <laughs> no, for skill bridge, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to add on uh, anything else, I guess. I, I don't think anything, I have anything else specific to say. If anybody has questions for me later, like I said, email me. Uh, that's what I'm here for. Well, I guess I'll just hop in and since we're talking about enrollment, um, once you work with Greg, if you're a skill bridge, you also will be connected to me. But for any of you, if you're interested in applying for a scholarship, I'm going to send out an email to everyone on this call. But let me just talk a little bit about the VA for a minute. Um, 
as some of you may know, the vet tech program has recently ended. I'm not sure if anyone was interested in vet tech or planning to use it, but unfortunately, as of April 1st, the program is no more as we know it. Um, so therefore, Co-Platoon is, is even more generous with scholarships. So right now we have several options, including veteran and military spouse scholarships, yep. black and Hispanic scholarships, women in tech scholarships, transgender veteran scholarships and active duty scholarships. Now, typically the application process, you would apply once you're accepted. But if you're interested in knowing if you have meet the eligibility requirements, you can email me and we can talk about that individually. Most likely, like I said, everyone receives either a full or a partial scholarship depending on eligibility criteria. Also, if you're planning to attend in person, we do accept GI Bill. So if you have any specific questions about your benefits, what your entitlement looks like, how many months we would use, all of that can be answered by me. And also, if you're interested, um, some students are applying for vr &E. It used to be Vogue Rehab, and some are getting approved. So if you're, if you're considering Vogue Rehab or vr &E for our program, I would suggest as to apply as early as possible so that you can get that squared away. And if you need documentation for a counselor, we can get that to you as well. Does anyone have any questions about VA benefits or about the scholarship process that I can answer? Okay. Um, actually, I do. Hello, um, I had a question. Yeah. Okay, who's first? <laughs> oh, you can go ahead. I'll wait. Okay, thank you. Um, if someone's interested in learning more about VR and E, and mm -hmm. if we want to apply to that, how can we um get more information? Yes, I'm glad you asked. I, in the email that I'm sending out also has a link on how to apply. So you can just reply to that email and then ask me any specific questions you have about it. But the awesome. actual application link will be in the email. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Um, my question was, uh, how long does it typically take to get accepted or to know if you got that scholarship? To get accepted into the program? Um, uh, Greg, do you have an answer for that one? Once you're accepted, though, I can answer the scholarship piece. I can let you know within a, a week to two weeks, I would say. Okay, awesome. That, that, thank you. Mm -hmm. What was the exact question? I was looking up the vr &E page on the VA's website to link it. What was the exact question? Oh, uh, how long does it typically take to know if you got accepted to or for a submission of a scholarship? Oh, oh well, the scholarship... Like I said, once you are already an accepted student and you submit the form, I can let you know within a week, um, within a week to two weeks, I would say. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tish. Mm -hmm. uh, for the DD-214, do you need like uh, one cent from specific place or do you just need a copy of it or for the GI Bill? For uh, your, your COE? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just a copy. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll drop my um, email in the chat as well. You can email me too. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I submitted my uh, Vogue rehab paperwork about, about a month and a half ago now. I haven't received a phone call, email, nothing. Uh, I've tried calling my uh, veteran service center uh, and they're just, they, they made me play phone tag with like two other local colleges. I, I'm in Colorado Springs uh, and yeah, that's like kind of, I've just, I've just been like bouncing back and forth and I haven't actually spoken to anybody that, that I guess does this. So, you know, might have to try to get a scholarship. Sorry. That's my Can you email me too? We'll try to do some research for you as well. Sure thing. Thank you. Thank you. And Thomas, I think you and I have spoken about this in the past, but for everyone else's uh, edification, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, I did just recently see a, a VA 
job email that went out and they are doing a hard push for more vr and e counselors all over the country which means that obviously there's a shortage so i think that's one of the biggest problems with vr and e in general is that there is a huge shortage of actual counselors who you can get in and interact with on this topic so the va is trying to address it it's going to take some time i know that doesn't help anyone in this particular spot right now but just understand that's if you're not getting a response on VR and E, that's probably why. And from everyone I've talked to, it seems to be very based on area. Certain areas you can get in a lot quicker, in other areas it takes longer. So, you know, do what you can. We'll, like Tish said, we'll try and do anything we can to help. Um, yeah, but uh, until then, like I said, the VA, the VA is actively pushing to hire more of those counselors for that reason. Any other questions for enrollment purposes or anything? Gary, you say you have a meeting with your counselor tomorrow. Can you ask if there are any other options? Ask the counselor or ask for uh, options for us for to pay. I, th I think Gary was going to ask on behalf of other people if there were other options, and then he could report back. Okay. He's um, he'll ask. He has a counselor, and he has a meeting, and he'll ask. Oh, he'll okay. Report back. Got you. Thank you. <laughs> Being helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone? Um, anyone want to hear about career services or are you guys still talking about enrollment and scholarships? <laughs> We're here to answer all of those questions. I think, you know, just opening this up, you know, we have, you know, we have plenty of time to talk about this, but yeah, we can, we can move to career services and kind of talk about, you know, what, what support students have, uh, while they're in Copeland and when they're, when they're leaving, uh, cause that's, uh, that's your specialty. So yeah. Great. Away. Great. I'm just. I'm going to do share my screen. I'm not doing a full presentation, but I'm just going to share a little bit. Uh, hold on, I got to find it here. Um, so obviously, most of you are considering, let me just go to the slideshow, considering Co-Platoon um, as a career transition or a pivot. So you don't want to just learn the skills, you want to get a job after that. So that's where career services comes into play. So we're kind of a two-pronged uh, mission. So one is that we're going to work with students. Oh, this has gone backwards. Hold on. I don't normally do a slideshow with this thing. Um, one is that we work with students. So as soon as you graduate, we essentially figure out your intention to work with us in terms of do you want to um, uh, look for an entry level role in tech within the next six months after graduation? That's sort of our working with you window. Although um, we work with anybody as long as they are motivated and interested in looking for a job. So it can be past that six month window. Um, not everybody is taking this course, obviously, for transitioning into a new role. Some people are hoping to learn new skills just for the sake of it. Some people are looking to go back to um, a degree program and finish that as well. So when we are working with them in career services, this is sort of the roadmap that we do for the first six to eight weeks of the um, period of time right after they graduate. So we focus in on resume prep, job matching, um, application and follow-up and networking and branding. Uh, I probably can't see all of these. Interviewing and then salary negotiation. Those are sort of our six major topics. Um, but we continue to go back and work on these throughout the six month time. So what we do is put people into accountability groups and those are based on um, location or timing or interests or, or just purely when you sign up for this class. Um, but your cohort will have break everybody into uh, about four to five people in an accountability group. And really it's to go over these best practices, but also hone in on what people are looking for and also motivate each other. So um, as Chad, who's on here, he is a um, motivated job seeker still. And we you know, continuously talk about best practices and what somebody else has found worked um, because in, this whole thing, it's more of a art than a science. You know, we can tell you all kinds of great um, uh, things to do and how to network and what your resume should look at. Oh my goodness, who wrote all my, over my thing? 
That's really weird. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I can write on it. That's what I was trying to figure out. That's really cool. I was like, did yeah. I do that while I was talking with my mouse? I'm so sorry. No worries. I'm just trying to get rid of the, the, uh, I think the it's, stuff. there you go. Okay. Awesome. Um, now we know. So real quickly, I just wanted to say, so two prong, we're working with students, but we're also working with corporations and trying to um, create networking for our students. So whether that's an apprenticeship program, an internship, or if it's a direct hire, you know, full-time role. So that's sort of our two-prong focus in career services. We are always working behind the scenes when we're not working directly with students to try and create new um, opportunities. And so you're probably going to ask me like, what's our placement rate? What's the median salary and all that kind of thing. And I can say historically, it's been one thing, but in the last year to be fully transparent, um, these tech roles for entry level jobs have decreased. So it is, it is harder to come out and just land a job, but it all depends on location, whether you want to be remote, it depends on where you want to work, what types of industries, what your experience has been prior, what degrees you have, what certifications you have, what um, you maybe you have a clearance. So it's super variable. So I can't predict anybody. And we would never say, you know, you're going to take this, um, you know, 15 weeks full stack software engineering and land a role. We are not guaranteeing any jobs coming out of this. So I want to make that point blank. I don't want to make it sound dire or desperate, but we do have great, you know, one-on-one -on -one career services. Um, we think they're great in that we are willing to work with everybody one-on-one -on -one also in these group cohorts. And these are the things we work with. And I'm going to stop sharing because I don't want to tell you too much about our program if you don't end up coming because then I would have just wasted my breath. But I'm open for any questions um, that I can help you, you know, ascertain if it's something for you in terms of how we work with students after they graduate. Also one thing to note, so the full stack software engineering program, we do work with you somewhat during the program. So we have um, companies who help us volunteer in resume coaching. So everyone gets a dedicated one-on-one -on -one resume coach before they even come to us. And then we rework it because we love to say, your resume is always evolving. Um, we also say you ask 10 people uh, about what your resume should look like and you're going to get 30 different answers. So it always helps to have a lot of different perspectives when it comes to resume building. Um, we also help with mock technical interviews and mock behavioral interviews, which is really helpful, not just from um, our career services, but from you know experts in the field who can help do that. So before, let me see if there are any questions. Are we encouraged to do our own job search? Of course, we are not handing you a job. So we are giving you tools and some resources and help with how to, you know, go about the process, but we are not handing anybody a job. We do have some dedicated apprenticeship partners, um, like for this current cohort, Whiskey, which is about to finish, they have an opportunity to have an apprenticeship with DRW that changes every cohort. Sometimes we have four or five partners, sometimes we have one. So it depends on the needs of the corporations at the time and our relationships with them. Um, jobs that I applied to, get, oh, Rich, or Chad is talking about it. Yes, yes, um, anything else? And then Alice has their hand raised. Oh, sorry, Alice, yes. Hi, yes, thank you, I had a question. Um, I You spoke about the full stack program, would that your, uh, would your services also apply for? DevOps and cloud? Yes, of course, definitely. We are here for everybody who goes through the Code Platoon um, training programs, both of them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are the internships limited only those who can attend in person? So currently this apprenticeship for DRW is an in-person one, but we have had them in the past that they're remote um, as well. So we have both. Any other questions? Projected to work with future cohorts. Right now, DRW is committed for the next several cohorts. Um, beyond that, no. Although we're always trying. Um, and you can look on our website. I mean, in the past, we've had Caesars Digital, uh, Rays, Affirm, um, CTC, Accenture. Um, Actually, we, so I should have said no so quickly. We do have some, but they don't always come up until the next year. So some of them are on a yearly cycle. Some of them coexist with our cohorts. Any other questions? Where do in-person courses take place? Chicago. 
So I am here in Chicago. That is where our brick and mortar office is. It is at the WeWork. It's in downtown Chicago. And generally we have about 25% of our class is in person. Um, by fire, do you mean fintech? You'll have to tell me what you mean by fire. <laughs> uh, finance, insurance, real estate. Um, Pretty, yeah, I'm no, we also, we, yeah, we don't have any DOD contracted apprenticeships uh, yet, um, but we have a lot of consulting companies. So more, not just, you know, not just finance or insurance, but yeah, Travelers has been good. Um, Pfizer, FinTech again. So insurance, FinTech sort of um, is pretty dominant. <clears throat> Other questions? Um, and I should point out, I mean, even people, I, I think I mentioned, you know, after the six months, that the six months is a number that the VA created when we did vet tech and as well as most placements, um, we are, we report, we report to an auditing um, third party institution called SIR, which is the Council for Integrity on Reporting. There's one more R in there. Um, and you can go on their website and see it's for fully transparent. A lot of boot camps do not report, you know, their transparency on placement rates. Uh, and graduation rates. So we do do that. Um, oh, nice. You work at Pfizer. Awesome. We're really happy with our Pfizer connection. Uh, I get so sidetracked by chat and then I don't finish my conversation. Sorry. So where was I? Um, Sir, reporting agency. Um, but I was trying to say that even after six months, um, so the 180 days meaningful employment rate kind of, or meaningful employment timing came up through VetTech, but it is an important rate. Like if you can't, you can't get a job within six months, that's that's a pretty typical placement rate. Now SIR is going out to one year. So we work with people and we also work with alumni who maybe they got an entry level role and they come back to us and they're like, hey, I need help with my resume. I'm applying to a new role. We're always here for them. So I just wanted to point that out, that we're not like, oh, your six months is over. We're not gonna work with you. We're, we will continue to look out for you. Of course, our priority is with the students who just graduated, but we are always um, networking on behalf of others. Chad, I don't want to put you on the spot, but anything I missed in terms of accountability groups or career services or um, I don't know, your your thought process on interviewing or any of that stuff. No, just if, if you do happen to make it through the program and you just listen to everything that Catherine says and you're going to be awesome. So <laughs> like everything they've said, I've, I've definitely have used in interviews and in, in all kinds of different situations. And it's it's helped out immensely because I, I it's taken me out of my comfort zone and, you know, making my expanding my comfort zone a little bit more. So it's it, it's been great. So I thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Um, Kevin, I feel like biggest barriers new grads come across, it's, uh, yeah, finding one that actually you fit all the criteria. So you're always going to apply to something that you don't fit all the criteria, right? But if they ask for a hard, you know, bachelor's in computer science and you don't have it, that's a huge barrier. If they ask for a clearance that you don't have, that's a barrier. Um, you know, if it has to be on site and you're not willing to relocate, that's been a barrier. So I, when I think about our cohorts where people are still struggling to find a role, it's usually because they can only do remote and remote is gonna get thousands of applications in these days for these entry level roles. So that is a huge barrier. Um, if, you know, so remote is a problem, um, you know, not having a degree doesn't always, isn't always the biggest hurdle because we have a lot of partners who are looking for non-traditional um, pathways into tech. And so they are recognizing that and they're saying you don't need a four-year degree and they actually have programs just for people who don't have four-year degrees. So then we get the people with the degrees who are like, ah, I don't meet that criteria. So um, I hope that answers that. Do you work with any companies that specialize in digital assets? Um, right now, I don't think I have any Coinbase or crypto type stuff. Um, but they're certainly out there. I, we don't have any partnerships right now. But if you know of somebody, we're always interested in being connected with more potential partners. So anybody else? Um, and oh, one other thing. I mean, we are here to work with you in career services 
if you are committed to looking for a job in entry level tech. Now, if you went through the whole program and you're like, you know what, coding, software development, just not for me, we're not going to just toss you aside. We are still want to help everybody transition either out of the military into a new job. So we have people who are looking more business analyst roles, using some of their project management, you know, from their military experience. We're not going to say, no, we can't help you. So we still have them in our cohorts and our accountability groups. So just of note. Um, exactly. So Nick just said, skills you'll learn in the program will make you competitive for many roles. So, you know, I mean, if entry level roles in tech, just if you if you've been out there for like a month and you're pounding the pavement and you haven't found something and you kind of want to start going in a different direction, that's that's perfectly acceptable. It's not our goal, but it's we're still going to work with you. That's bottom line. We are a nonprofit, so our goal is to help you. I was going to add on to just exactly what Catherine just said. For everybody's knowledge, I think everyone at Code Platoon is really good at exactly that. We will talk to you even if, like I've talked to people who didn't end up going to Code Platoon. I'm still going to help them. I'm still going to help direct, give them some guidance. I am happy to do that. And I think everybody at Code Platoon is the same. Yes, we would love it if you come to Code Platoon. Yes, we want you to see you succeed. But that second part is more important, really, to all of us. And I think everybody's attitude reflects that. So if you have questions that you think, I'm not sure if I want to ask this because it might make me seem like I don't want to go there, ask it anyway. <laughs> Email us privately and we'll still talk to you. We'll still help you however we can. Looks like we have a yeah message from Curtis. If attending class in person, could a student switch to remote if for some reason they are unable to continue in person? Um, yeah, it looks like it. I think I do it. Tish, is that accurate though? Based on, I mean, I guess we don't have the, that tech anymore, so that's not the concern. GI Bill. So, the yeah, only I right. I was going to say the only time it would be a potential issue is if you're a student attending with the GI Bill because that is currently in person only. But any other method of uh, funding, it would be no issue as far as transferring to remote. If you are a GI Bill student who had a situation where it changed, we would, you know, obviously work with you on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. Sure. Anyone else? Anything? Anything at all? Uh, yeah, I got a question. Um, so how flexible are you guys with people that are doing virtual and have um, appointments like uh, VA? Because I'll be in that window where I need to do VA appointments during the, uh, the class time if I do get accepted. Yeah, we are. We're 100 percent flexible with that. Um, there's, uh, I mean, a lot of, a lot of folks are in transition or just recently transitioned. And so they're going to have those appointments. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, uh, that one's easy. Um, if you have to miss a bit of lecture, that's why they're recorded. So recording this one because you're going to post it on and you can check it out later. It's like, we have another question from Kevin Garrett. Uh, how is the in-person job market in Chicago? Uh, I want to do remote yet. I could apply for both remote and on-site roles as well. And originally uh, from Chicago. So, I mean, if you're coming back to Chicago, the, the job market in Chicago is, is hit or miss. I mean, we have our strongest partnerships with Chicago-based companies because when we started, we were founded in 2016 and all of our stuff was in person. So we had our you know, all of our graduates here, and then we were finding them roles here in Chicago. We have definitely branched out. So, you know, working with travelers, Pfizer, companies that are not Chicago based, we are definitely expanding. Um, I wouldn't say it's more robust or not, but if you are not in a tech city, then I would say get yourself to Chicago or a tech city. It would be easier, you know, to be on site than to just look for a role, um, you know, that is in the middle of nowhere, Iowa or something. So. Does that answer your question, Kevin? I mean, why wouldn't you want to come back to Chicago? It's awesome. 
do we really want to compete that right now? I mean, we can. <laughs> okay. It's about to be summer. So it's awesome. <laughs> the winter is almost over. It's awesome. How are those Blackhawks doing? Hmm? Hmm? The winter is never over up here in North. It sucks. <laughs> Wait, the Blackhawks, Greg, we are building a pipeline. We are going to be <laughs> awesome in two years. We wait. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, what would be some of the main reasons some people don't uh, complete the course? Nick, maybe that's yours. I don't know, Aaron. Um, so <laughs> This is going to sound a little bit weird and a little bit cliche. The only reason people don't complete is because they give up. Um, oh. They get in their own heads and they feel like they can't do it. And then they talk themselves out of being able to complete it. But we've built and structured this program over the years to be a good on-ramp from people who have no experience to being uh, competitive in entry-level roles in software engineering. So we're going to work with you and motivate you and give you all the tools and stuff you need to succeed. Uh, as long as you get out of your own way, you will complete the course. There's no question about that. I just have a caveat, Nick. There are always personal, medical, there are always reasons why someone might have to step away from the program, yep. but then they are given the opportunity to rejoin a different cohort later. So Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. That's a good question from Danielle. Uh, uh, my husband's still active duty, and we may be moving overseas in the next few years. Do you find that remote opportunities are open to working with veterans who are forced to move overseas? Um, there are some. There are some that allow you to work remote, and you can work remote, uh, you know, across borders. Um, my experience, uh, I've been mostly in defense. So once I, you know, I kept my clearance and moved over, uh, you have to be in the United States. Like, sometimes you work remote, but you have to be in the States. You can't take your computer anywhere else. So um the, it's hit or miss uh, i know my sister she works in the, in the consulting firm and they don't let her work outside of the states either so there, there are some limitations to that and i would just add to that we do have several students that we're currently working with who have chosen to move back to spain france you know european countries um and they are having you know they have to go through visa issues to get the work permits but we are you know trying to find them roles so we we still will work with you it is a much harder ask or task. Um, but there are a lot of companies out there who are willing to work um, mill spouses. And as long as your spouse is at active duty, they will, you know, give you the remote ability, even though you know, they want you on site. So there's a lot of internship and apprenticeships like Wells Fargo, for instance, has a hiring our heroes program. And if you are um, if your spouse is active duty, then you have the ability to produce that document. You can get the remote cleared, even though that everybody else is on site. So there's a lot of companies that offer that, but overseas is a different issue. On that note, I'm going to put in the, uh, in the chat, I will put the link. We had a student about a year and a half ago named Kana. And she made a whole series of videos about her experience going through Code Platoon, um, which was great. She did it of her own. She did like a 10-minute video of each week in the cohort. But the kicker to this was that she did the entire cohort from Denmark as a military spouse. So she never stepped a single foot in the United States doing the program or getting a job. So we know that it is actually possible to do this, to pull this off. Um, I'm going to link the first the first of the videos here as soon as, let's see. That's the first video. We have a playlist somewhere. I just haven't found it yet. But at any rate, it's a great playlist for those of you who are preparing for the program and want to know, you know, week by week, what am I going to expect? Kana did a great job of kind of offering that overview. Some of the curriculum might be a little bit outdated because I think it was a year and a half ago and these things do change, but uh, sh she did a great job of summarizing what it was like to go through the program. So again, it's it's proof that yes, it is very possible to do this completely remote, not even in the United States and still land a job. Can you give an update on her? I don't know, Catherine, do you know where 
I, I know she. Yeah, she moved back to the States. Oh, she she had a job. She That job was sort of an eight month job. And then that company sort of fell. It was a startup, I believe. And now she actually is back in a Hiring Our Heroes um, internship mm -hmm. with Booz Allen. So she's uh, doing well. And that was, she's able to do that remote as well because her spouse is still active duty. There you go. At any rate, great resource all the way around. I think Curtis asked a question about learning style or preference, benefits or advantages to attending in-person versus remote. I will just add that um, I know there's probably a lot more interesting things or relevant, but if you work in the WeWork building, which is where we have our offices downtown, like every other day they have a wine and cheese happy hour for free. So that's a bonus of in-person. Uh, I think just being immersed with a cohort right there working together is is fairly valuable if that's how you prefer to work. Um, you know, everyone's doing pair programming virtually anyway, but when you're sitting next to someone and you can just yell out like, hey, can anybody ask, you know, help me? That's a huge bonus. But Nick and Aaron would probably have more relevant <laughs> about pair programming since I'm not technical at all. I I was a... I was a remote learner, so I was here in the St. Louis area. Um, but it was a great immersion into how I've been working since I graduated Good Platoon, because I've been mostly remote. I've had some. I was with Booz Allen for a bit, and we did go in the office, but we didn't go in the office all the time. It was optional, and we can just stay at home anyway. So it, is a, it was a good introduction into you know just that whole software development cycle using Agile and and all the the, the stand-up meetings and you know everything that you know I do day to day still was was learned in Code Platoon. So it was a good it was a good uh, intro into the remote working lifestyle. I'll add another in-person pro though. Um, there are a few networking opportunities that are just right in like uh, this week. There's one at Soldier Field, so I know the class is taking some time and going to a you know, a veteran hiring fair together, um, as well as there've been a couple little on-site, um, just go check out a software company that's in the building, you know, and and learn from them. So there are a few things that you, you would miss out on, but yeah. Oh, and headshots. We have a, a photographer who comes in and does pro bono headshots for your LinkedIn profiles, but you can also do that virtually because there's something called um, Portraits for Patriots. So you can do that on your own anywhere. So that's all good. Any other questions? Um, Catherine did put her email up there. Again, all the Coplatoon emails are pretty easy. First name at coplatoon.org. Um, but, you know, we can continue conversations in Slack. Uh, if you ask a question uh, in our in our room, uh, you know, I know me, Nick, uh, I think Tish and Greg are, are all in there. Uh, and lastly, I didn't actually formally introduce our TA, uh, but uh, Chad Martin, I came on board uh, with the cohort to the last minute. And uh, he just graduated from a cohort and uh, I'm glad to have him on board. So he'll be assisting in the, in the chat. So when you ask questions, he can help answer them, you know, when, when I'm in lecture uh, and he'll also be around, you know, every now and then help uh, in Slack as well. So, um, that's, well, thanks everybody for uh, giving the spiel. Can I give him the intro to, to Coplatoon? Um, with that, uh, we are going to uh, transition uh, to to a bit of an overview um, of, of our material. Uh, I did want to kind of highlight some things that you, we received in the, in the Slack channel. Um, and so has everybody had a, ch a chance to take a look uh, at the material? If you haven't, um, you can go to GitHub and see it. So um, a, a few things, but let me go ahead and share my screen. Thanks all. Yeah. 
okay, Nick, I may pop out because I may have to grant permissions. <laughs> Let's see here. I thought I did this before and I didn't. Okay. Um, let's do this. Let's go ahead and take a break. So let's take a 10 minute break so I can get this. I thought I did this before and I guess it did not take for me. So um, yeah, let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll come back at, um, let's just come back at seven and then we can uh, actually start the material. So I will pause the recording. Record and can everybody still see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, yeah. So uh, again, just to kind of reiterate everything that happened in the, in the last hour, you know, one thing about Cool Platoon that you know I've loved is is the is the support that you have. You know, going into training, you know, during during the cohort, um, and then afterwards the career services. You know, myself, I really didn't utilize it too much. Um, I kind of did my own job searching here and, and found a found a role pretty quickly, um, but they're there and they they work hard. They're constantly putting messages out there uh, on our staff channels uh, about you know opportunities and and um, and other things available to recent graduates or anybody looking for a role. Our alumni channel has a bunch of roles being posted all the time. You know, people asking about about roles or. or or people posting roles on, you know, maybe a new startup or something like that. So uh, it really is a great program to be affiliated with. Um, you know, I thought it was one of the best decisions I made uh, in my life joining Code Platoon. Um, I was also a Skillbridge student, so um, I don't know how much the requirements have changed from when I went through about four years ago. But, um, you know, if you have any questions and you want to ask it, I can perhaps answer some as well. So, uh, but let's, yeah, let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, so, you know, for the rest of the evening, we're going to kind of go over a bit of background stuff. Um, I wasn't going to lecture this pre-course. This is meant to be more of a, uh, I think, to read on your own, kind of give you some links, uh, some, some, uh, uh, some ways to get, you know, to, to use the tools, kind of give you some exposure to some some uh, terminology, some background information. If you are totally 100% unfamiliar uh, with coding, uh, this is a good starting point. This course is a good starting point. Um, a little bit of more background on me. Uh, since I started coding, uh, I did teach Python a bit part-time for um, uh, NGA. So uh, um, it was a, a course a lot like this one. It was meant to help uh, a lot of the geospatial analysts go over and you know use you know strengthen their scripting skills to to help analyze imagery, uh, and so this was this was a great opportunity to kind of keep teaching. Whenever I I moved from Booz Allen, where I was teaching, I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, this was a nice opportunity that opened up to help me or to allow me to teach still. So, um, but yeah. So again, the emails that you have uh, in this. In this pre-course, you have some of that for our, our key personnel. You will be talking to Guillermo. Uh, I'm going to try and get him on next week because uh, he's the one who's going to be uh, giving you your, your live coding uh, assessment. And then I kind of go over some tools that we have uh, talking about Slack, which is our primary communication tool, um, and then GitHub and GitHub code spaces. Um, we had a question over the break on... Um, do we need to download and vis install Visual Studio uh, code as well? And we do not. Uh, GitHub Code Spaces, you can do that there. You can run, you can run a full-on VS Code window in the cloud for free, uh, and you can drag and drop your files in there, run them, keep them, uh, do what you want with them. And we're going to be using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, that's how we'll be presenting the material. You don't ha do not have to use Jupyter Notebooks, but I have found they are the best for teaching Python and evaluating Python. Uh, when you're learning how to code and you have no idea how script works, you can break your code up into segments to kind of see how it's working. Uh, and it is very, very useful. Um, and I will, you know, here's some uh, online REPL resources you can have. Uh, 
these are these are good because uh, Repolit is one of our one of the websites we use for some of the exercises, and so you'll need to know how to use uh, a Repl. Um, so we have some of that information there. So again, take a look at it. You don't have to look at it now. You can take a look at it later. But I just put some good useful links in there uh, for for you to kind of take a look at. So uh, this course is just Python based um, for learning the coding concepts you need to succeed and get into code platoon and pass the assessment. Uh, we are going to be focusing completely on Python. In the cohort, you will learn JavaScript. Uh, so, you know, but luckily you already have a good base knowledge to understand how code executes because it operates the same way. It's just a different, different way of, you know, speaking, different way of writing. So, yeah, we will not be uh, messing with JavaScript uh, at all. Um, in the lesson itself, uh, again, like I said, we have the Jupyter notebooks here, um, but I also did copy them over to HTML. So if you, you know, if you know you don't have Visual Studio Code and you don't really want to preview your notebook in you know GitHub, uh, you can take the HTML file, download it. You can open it up locally in your browser, um, and then I also have PDFs as well. So you can take a look at those if you'd like. I encourage you to jump on to GitHub Code Spaces. Um, so let me, in fact, I did want to open up GitHub code spaces because I really do encourage everyone to, you know, get a GitHub account and take a look at it. There is no coding knowledge needed. So you go to GitHub here, and then we'll take a look here. So we have code spaces. So again, I'm going to just show the whole process to get up and moving with this and uh, but you know if you haven't used github or github code spaces this is a good little tutorial to do so but you can go to github and register for account um, if you get into code platoon you're going to have a github account anyway so i i encourage you to go ahead and make one they're they're free uh, and the code spaces are free up to a point but for this course i believe everything will be free um, but when you get into code spaces here uh, you're left with this, you know, quick start templates. And all you have to do is use a blank template. So you can go to a, go to a blank template and it will start up. And it looks very familiar because it is VS code in a container on the web. And so I'll zoom it in here. And this, this VS code window is already has Python installed. So all we have to do is just install Jupyter. So you can go in here and just type in Jupyter. Uh, there it goes. And you have Jupyter right here as the first one. You have 77 million downloads. It's fairly popular. Same with a lot of the other Jupyter ones. You can just click install. And it will just take a minute or two to install. And when it's done, it gives you the welcome screen for that. Um, and you are good to start coding. Uh, so if you, um, if you've downloaded the files from GitHub, which you don't have to, you know, you don't have to fork this repo. If you don't know what I'm talking about. You don't have to fork anything over. Uh, you can go to our Jupyter notebooks and when you, uh, click on them. So if we click on the problem solving one, there's a little download, uh, raw file right here. So if you select that and it downloads, um, for me, it'll open up in VS Code. Um, but wherever you save that file to, so I'll go to my downloads here. Uh, in my downloads, I have my problem solving uh, notebook right here. Um, move it over here so you can see. And I'll pull up my code space again. Oh, not that one. Here it is. You can take that sucker and drop it right there into that file browser. And then you're up and running with using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, it'll ask to install an extension. Just go ahead and uh, accept. But you should be able to get going right away. Following, follow along with the code. Uh, you can edit code. You can run code. So 
those requirements, we wanted the we wanted the course to be you know to have no requirements, just having the web access, and you can get in there and still play with code. And this is not the only solution, but this is one of the best ones if you want to get into using Jupyter Notebooks. Any questions on this process, getting up to speed with uh, a Jupyter Notebook? I did get a, a DM. Uh, so uh, one thing about, uh, about this uh, chat, I think sometimes it does default to direct messages. Um, I encourage everyone to ask questions in public chat. I know if, if you just do not want to ask a question in public chat, you know, you can, you can direct message, but most likely someone's going to have the same question as you. Uh, but I did get one question about how did Jupyter Notebooks compare to Google's collaboratory? Um, I've never used Google's collaboratory. I've only used Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so I really, I really can't see, but has anybody else used Google collaboratory? Oh, I've I never see. used like a Google collaboration space, and no. Okay, yeah, I've, I've never used it, but and, you know, it's it, I have I have no idea even what it is. I'll have to look it up. But um, uh, yeah, but you know, for as far as like running this, you know, looking at you know, Jupyter Notebook, this is like it's it's great for for learning Python. So, um. Yeah, if, if you just didn't catch that, you want to watch the recording, I'm recording this, so I'll be posting this on YouTube uh, tonight. So, you, you know, if, if you missed some of the lecture, um, you can come back and look at it. But, um, yeah, let's just dive into the first lesson then. Um, and so uh, the, the lessons, I have the lesson uh, kind of outlined in the, uh, the, the pre-course. Um, and really, we're going to start with just Python basics and then some problem-solving strategies. So... You know, I think it's important that we kind of start looking at how we think about problems as a uh, software engineer, as a coder, because the way you process information is just a bit different than how you would uh, approach a problem in a traditional sense, sense or a human centric sense. So, um, you know, we're you know, the, basically the, the job that I have is a professional problem solver. So, you know, we have a solution that our client wants and, you know, they want me to write code that will effectively, you know, give them what they want be using computer code and using, you know, machine learning methods and you know, everything else that, you know, I deal with. Um, and we, we have to be able to solve those problems. So, you know, whether you're doing a web application or machine learning models, you're going to have these complex problems that you may have to kind of think about, how, how am I going to break this down? You know, do I need to talk to somebody to, to kind of get a solution? Do I need to import some, some new library that I don't know about that someone else may have? Um, that is an important, the, the, the skill of collaboration, the skill of, you know, breaking down a complex problem into smallest pieces and thinking like the computer will help you, uh, will help you do your job. Um, but let's go ahead and dive into some Python basics. And so we do have some vocabulary. So this is kind of the boring vocabulary definition piece. But and we start with like syntax. Um, this syntax is typically how code is written. And one of the reasons we deal mostly with Python is because the Python syntax, one of their focuses was, you know, it needs to be readable. It needs to be easy to read. Uh, that provides quite a big uh, computing overhead. Python is definitely not the fastest language around, but it is the easiest to read. And so um, that is important to a lot of people. And it's a, led a lot of people, you know, a lot of people kind of get turned on to code when they realize, oh, wow, it's actually really easy to use Python. And so uh, if you think about Python, Python has, you know, if you look at, you know, you think about code in general, you know, code has a lot of those curly braces, right? When you look at new JavaScript or Java or um, a lot of the other languages, they have curly braces and, you know, some other, other weird, you know, terms like, you know, like, you know, system line out or, you know, that aren't exactly translatable to English. Um, but Python uses very, very nice terminology and spacing and tabs to break up its code 
And so um, it doesn't mean you can't make it unreadable because some people can successfully make Python unreadable, um, but that's not the intent. Uh, and it's not, it, you know, the intent of the designer of the language. So, um, but Python is still strict when it comes to syntax. So if you have a syntax error, uh, you wanna, uh, it will give you an error. So you need to make sure that you have uh, the correct syntax. And the beauty of an IDE is if you have a mistake in your code, it will typically highlight it for you before you run the code. Uh, the, next, the next piece here is variable. So um, variables are key to any language because we want to make sure we define variables with you know, values, uh, especially static values. You don't want to have static values in code. Um, just like in algebra, you know, we had x equals you know, whatever. It works the same exact way. Uh, but they are a bit different uh, with, with coding. One, we don't want to use single letter variable names. With Python, you want to use descriptive names. Um, and then Python, uh, the syntax we have is typically lowercase letters with underscores. Uh, that's called snake case. So um, <laughs> it's considered bad practice to use, uh, to use those single letters. Um, oh, one other thing with, with these uh, Zoom calls, you want to make sure that you're muted. So um, I should be able to mute uh, some folks, but yeah, just kind of take a look at your, your name or video feed. And if it says, you know, mute, just make sure you mute yourself. Um, with variables, uh, they are created or signed with the assignment operator or the equal sign. Uh, but unlike you see in math where the equations do use equal sign, uh, a single equal is, is used to assign things. So if you take a look at this code here, let me go ahead and select my kernel first, get it up and running. Um, if I want to assign uh, a variable, I would do it just like that. And then I'm going to go ahead and call it so we can see it. And when I run this code, I get back 25. Uh, so now my variable equals 25. It will stay that way until I reassign it. So um, that's variables. And so, you know, defining variables is going to be a, a good, it's good to practice it in the beginning. Uh, so if you think you're going to use something, you know, go ahead and assign it to a variable uh, and get used to doing that. Um, comments here. Uh, these are typically preceded in code with a, uh, with a uh, pound sign. And those comments are ignored by the computer. So if you take a look at my list here, go ahead and clear my outputs. Uh, any line with a comment will turn gray in, in my version here. Uh, it may turn a different color or look differently on whatever version you have because you can style these uh, development environments. And then anything to the uh, to the the left of the the pound sign will run, and it's highlighted different colors. But everything to the right is kind of grayed out, but you can still read it. And so that's meant. Comments are meant to to provide little notes for yourself or for other developers. If you're working on the same project, um, you're not going to remember what you did sometimes with a function you define or something else. You may have a, a complex way of turning data into another form. Uh, that's what uh, comments are for. And so if you take a look, it did not interrupt any of the code running. I defined a list and then I printed. Uh, the list here. Of course, one of the uh, one of the most important uh, pieces of of Python or Python functions or methods. Uh, you have if you've already started your your um, coding challenges, you've seen functions because some of them kind of have you like write the stuff inside of a function. So like what the function is actually doing, and so. Uh, it's important to think about functions as little programs or applications. And these little programs or applications, uh, really they have one job. They wanna take in something and that something could be nothing and then do something and then provide an output. So um, just like a car engine, right? You know, you have to put in, you, know, you have to put in a few things for an engine to work, right? You have to put in some, well, gasoline or some type of fuel. They need to have air and they need to have spark. So those three, those, those three things allow you to get, you know, 
wherever the output is, which is power, which is movement, right? So that's the same exact thing with a, a computing function. You have these inputs, you know, the, they're called parameters, and that's down here, or arguments, right? They take in something, and then all this code in here is kind of what runs when the, when the function is called. So you define the function here, and then you call the function later when you actually want the function to run. So what you're doing in your coding challenges is you're kind of, you're, you're writing the how, what, what's happening inside of the function. And once it's written, then it, anything, any other part of the program can use it without having to think about all the specifics, what's inside of the function. So, uh, so they're first defined, which means they're written out with all the included code, then they're called with the inputs. And so if you look here, I have like my function definition here, and then I defined another thing. This is a string and it's, you know, a bunch of names. And then I'm calling the function down here. And I'm saying, hey, you know, what's this function doing? Well, if you have a good name for a function, you probably know what it's gonna do. But if not, you can also have comments to describe what it does, but it's a find name function. So. I want to find Aaron Wood in my long string of data. So that's the target name and the input data. And then the code we wrote in here actually does the function. And so I can just put new names here and I don't have to worry about what's in the code anymore. I just put my names here. And so that's how it works. And if you take a look, oh, it did find my name in there because my name is in there. And so if this was a list of 10,000 names, you definitely need this function. And so that's what you know, that's, that's the beauty of functions and you always want to break up your code. And so when we think about, you know, problem solving with Python, you know, that's what we're doing. We're kind of breaking up our code into little smaller problems that we want to solve. And you're putting all those solutions together into a script, a, a big program script. So uh, I did mention the arguments of parameters. Again, those are the inputs to a function. And if you see the parameters are target name and input data, right? But they get defined when the function's called. So target name, it's the same thing as, you know, defining something uh, right here, like long chain of data. When the function runs, target name becomes Aaron Wood, and then input data becomes this long string of data. And so it gets defined. And again, that, that just allows for the encapsulation piece of running logic inside of its own little kind of world, if you will. And that's, that's what, that's the beauty of functions. Uh, another, another uh, key term that you'll hear a lot with Python is a library or module. Um, and that is, you know, those collection of code that finds these methods, you know, behind the scenes, there's a bunch of programs or, or functions written for Python that's included with it. So when you download Python as a coding language, you're going to get all these functions, but they're not going to be active when you run Python by itself. You have to kind of instantiate them by running an import. So they're important at the top of your Python file or wherever. So if I wanna, if I wanna add a cell here by using the, the plus code, um, if I wanna import a, a, a library, it's as simple as that. So now I have the random library and I can do whatever I want with it, right? But you know, I don't know what functions I have available to me. I can go look them up. So you can, you can just go on the web and actually look up, you know, the, the Python random library. And this here will give me, you know, kind of a description. So it's module generates pseudo random numbers. And then this will tell you like what kind of methods it has with it that you can use to, to do like different randomization functions. And so it has all the, all these are, are little functions written in Python that you don't see because you don't really care what's inside of it. You just want to get the random numbers, you know, and you want to, you know, maybe different ways. This tells you how you can do it without you worrying about what's in the code. So. Any questions on the quick vocabulary that we did here? All 
All right. Um, so in Python, we also have some reserved keywords. Um, and I also include some links to the, some of these resources. You can take a look at them uh, on your own. But these are the special words that Python already kind of has uh, reserved where you cannot use them in code. And typically, you're not going to use them anyway. Um, but, you know, they're going to have some sort of formatting. If you take a look here, um, they're going to be like bolded green words uh, where we can't, you, you know, you definitely are going to use them. Um, you know, and the, here's the keyword list. So if you actually run this in a Jupyter Notebook, if you're, if you're coding along with me, uh, you can run these cells. Uh, you can change things. So if you want to see some other things, uh, you can also use like the Python help method to kind of see what else you can do. But uh, these are all the keywords that you can't define into variable names. So they're going to show up, you know, very uniquely. Like here, it looks like it turns it, you know, into italics and it's like a blue color on my screen. And then here's like another one, it turns, it turns red. You've like imports one of them. So here it turns red there. So uh, it's kind of important to keep these in mind. We're gonna go over uh, quite a few of these anyway as like lesson topics. So um, yeah, it'll be fun. But uh, yeah, we have uh, here of our keywords. Any questions on, on those? My uh, my keywords are not quite showing up yet because I I just installed the Jupyter and uh, Python kind of it basically just follow the prompts. So I don't know if I'm just off on something. Okay, it's yeah, an extra it, extension. It's an extra extension for the uh, keywords. Are oh, you talking about uh, uh, you can't get it to print? Did you, did yeah, you actually write it for keyword? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to print the uh, print that list, that keyword list, and it's just not showing up. Okay, it, it could be an issue with your like kernel or something else. Uh, um, that can help you whenever we get to like uh, people will have some time to kind of go over exercises and other things. Uh, I can help you then. Sweet. Yeah, it's not a requirement for the course to be coding along. If you want to just kind of watch, take it in, uh, and you know, watch later. If you want to code along later, you can do that too. Um, but I'll be running cells uh, in the lecture, kind of showing you some of the output that we have. Um, if you want to try and get onto GitHub Code Spaces, try that out. You know, that that could be a, a possibility too. Um, Python also has built-in methods. Oh, it works. Sweet. Okay, yeah, we'll help out with some of the, you know, helping out with some of the uh, the Jupiter stuff uh, uh, at the end of after lecture. Uh, we will have some time after after the class for like office hours, and then maybe if you want to, we want to look at a, uh, something more in depth. We can do that, you know, as a class. Um, but you know, the Python built-in functions; uh, these are functions that are already inherently native to Python. You don't have to import them or anything. Um, and if you click the link, you're going to get to this, you know, this built-in functions list here. Um, so all these are basically uh, included with Python. And then it has their nice definition here. Sometimes even shows, you know, kind of an example how to use it. Um, and we're going to go over some of these, uh, quite a few of these actually, uh, in some of the lessons. Uh, but what's nice about these Okay, so you having trouble seeing my screen still? Is that better? Okay, cool. I'll make this one a little bigger too then. How's that? Can you see my Jupyter Notebook now, Michael? Oh, you're talking about this here? There you go. 
Okay, awesome. Um, and so we, some of those words have special appearances, uh, these, these methods, and um, they are not like the keywords where they can't be reassigned. So that's just a, a warning. I'll, I'll warn you again, because you know someone will take one of these methods and redefine it and all of a sudden they don't have functionality anymore. It's not the end of the world, you can just restart the kernel and it will give you back your included method, but you can overwrite these. Um, but they, these have logic behind the scenes that you don't have to worry about that will do something for you. And um, the most common one that you've already seen is the print method here. So I've, I've actually run it in a couple spots now, print my list and, you know, uh, this wasn't defined by me. It was already green, you know, when I, when I just typed it out, uh, what the, the internal functionality, I have no idea how you would like code getting stuff to go from input to an output. You know, I just don't know the internal workings and language. Luckily, print does it for me. And um, you'll use this a lot in your coding career uh, because it's a pretty powerful debugging tool. So you can kind of see what your data is doing as you're running a program. Uh, but it's nice because you don't have to think about it. You just call them and do, it does the thing that you want it to do. Uh, another one is, you know, turning a data type from a string into a number. Uh, you can do that with a, a, you know, a built-in function. So um, with print, you know, we want to have a parameter goes in there. Like in this one here, you know, we can call print with empty you know, parentheses, but it's going to expect something to print out. And so the whole purpose is you give it a parameter and then it puts the parameter in the output. And so here, the parameter I'm passing in to the print method is this keyword dot keyword list, which is a list, and then it prints out the list. So that that is the output. It's the same thing as you know the console log in JavaScript. That's the same exact concept. It's just a different word. With Python, print is a little more easy to digest. We kind of understand what it means. We want to print something. And these so. these are called dependencies, like the the keyword or libraries. Is there like an interchange between those terms? Um, yeah, dependency is typically a a dependency is typically something that's not Python native. So when you're importing like um, like pandas or um, you know others, there's a bunch of different libraries we use uh, all the time um, that aren't included Python natively. And then you have to import them and they have, then when you, when you actually install them in your machine using, you know, pip or something, uh, when they get installed, then you have access to them, but then you have to make sure you keep track of that dependency. When you, when you package your software together and you gotta, you know, tell people, Hey, you have to install these things. Usually it's in the, some sort of environment file that you'll include with your code base. And then when they install the environment, then they can actually run everything. And so those dependencies will have their own built-in methods. They just won't be native to Python. Right now, I'm only talking about native Python. So when you install Python, you get all this stuff. Uh, you also get um, these libraries included with Python. So you don't have to actually install anything separately, but you do have to import them where then they're activated, if you will. So a dependency is kind of external software that is outside of Python. And then you have your built-in methods or built-in functions uh, inside of Python. And then you have, your, you have your libraries, which are part of Python, but they're not active. So you have to kind of like activate them with this import statement. You also have to import your, the external dependencies that you downloaded. You still have to run the import to actually pull them in but they just involve the extra step of actually downloading it. So, but yeah, we, I mean, again, you have to think about how functions are constructed, right? So we have a, again, this is our like custom function, right? That we, that, that I wrote just to kind of do something, right? And we can take a look at the logic inside of the function and, and, and see what's happening here. With these methods, we don't. We don't see it, and we don't really care about what it's doing. We just we just want to, the description of what it does, 
Okay, tell me what I have to give it so it gives me what I want. That's really all I care about. Um, and if you think about it, that's exactly how like, you know, when you think about factories and assembly lines and, you know, mass production, they're, they're constructed that way. They're constructed with pieces that do their own thing. And, you know, like a robot arm that's designed to just grab a bottle and put it somewhere else. And then the, the, the conveyor belts just run their conveyor belt and they put them all together into this functioning machine that works. It's exactly the same thing with software engineering. You're taking these functions, these methods, and you're putting them all together in these little pieces, and you're combining them into this working uh, logic that runs. And it all runs in the same concept of, you know, when you write a script, Python runs top down. It just may run top down on several, you know, hundreds of files, but eventually get to the end. It's going to work the exact same way. But this, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, how Python runs and these problem solving strategies, that's what we want to start thinking about. How are we going to put this stuff together? And it's something that's, it doesn't come easy. It's going to, it's going to be very confusing initially, but it's once you, once you get there, it's, it really opens up a lot of possibilities to you, not only, you know, for career, but also for, um, for your own personal life. You know, you can quickly do some stuff like, you know, you know, you're dealing with your finances. Like if you can write a, a personal budget thing. Another example I did with, um, we had like a, a cornhole tournament uh, for my church. And so they say, hey, you know, can you help out? It's like, sure. And so I built like this, you know, this Python based scoring thing where people can come up to a kiosk or to my computer, type their name, and then it'll automatically randomize and give, you know, the matches and then calculate the final score. Now with these little functions and all this stuff and it worked all in sync with how our night went. But you know, it it didn't take me very long. It took me just a couple hours to write it, but it was it was kind of a cool little thing to do instead of finding a website with a bunch of ads and you know, so any questions on this first portion? You know, the the keyword, the basics of vocabulary. Awesome. And so let's Let's think about the problem solving strategy. So uh, there's not gonna be a lot of examples here. This is kind of a, just, a, uh, just kind of a, you know, exposing you to some ways that we can tackle problems when we're, uh, when we're, you know, actually getting to writing code. And we wanna, we wanna come up with a solution to a problem. Now I do have an example at the bottom here, but like, first we wanna take a problem, we kind of understand it. We want to understand what's the problem. Typically, our client, if you're working in, you know, as a software engineer, you know, especially with in my, in my role as a, a consultant, you know, our client's going to have the problem, and they're going to say, "Hey, I want to pay you money to solve my problem." Here it is, and, you know. If we say, "Yeah, we want to solve your problem," so cool, pay us, and you know, they're going to give you the problem, and then you're going to have to kind of understand it. So you want to take it and say, "Okay, you know, what what are they trying to accomplish here?" You know, they want to, you know, they want to evaluate, you know, um, these machine learning models, see if they can actually, you know, be used in their operations. You know, for me, like, you know, in, in my in my role, my current company, we're looking at machine learning models to, you know, drive hazards forecasting for aircraft. And so we're going out into academia, finding these models, and then we're we're running them and then we're turning them into APIs and we're saying, Hey, here's, you know, and then we're benchmarking and see if they work. And so we have to kind of understand what they really want. Um, in a more basic sense with like problems, uh, with coding, like we have to think of, okay, what, what are my input and, you know, output, uh, what am I looking at for coming in what's going out? And then what's the behavior, um, you know, if your client's just like, yeah, just give me some numbers. You know, I, I just want to process these these checks, and I want you know you to make sure the balances are good in the account, right? Well, I mean, is that like, what do you mean checks? Like, are these like digital checks? Do they have like floats or do they have you know integer numbers? Like, what do you mean? Are they are they encrypted? Do we have to think about that? Do we do we have any security constraints? that we need to think about with, with financial stuff. Um, and so you'll just want to kind of break down these problems for this course. We're probably not thinking about this stuff. 
the input output, the behavior. There may be some ambiguity, but these are gonna be spelled out for you in a lot of the problems here, okay? Um, for constraints and requirements, you know, how long does it take? Um, to be honest with you, I haven't really thought about constraints until I got into my current role with like machine learning. Uh, when I do have to think about time, I do have to think about memory and resources because uh, some of our models, we have to train them. They take sometimes days to train on a like machine with like three or four GPUs. And, you know, typically you're not going to think about that now uh, and you know, while you're learning about code, but it's something you will have to consider if you, if you get into the field. Um, requirements and edge cases are, are important. You know, when you're thinking about how you're going to tackle a problem. We have some really good exercises at the end uh, of this course that really kind of tests, like how are we gonna deal with some of these special requirements and edge cases uh, as we're building this, this thing. So uh, this will be a good test of that. And then just understanding, you know, the, the real world impact of what we're doing, right? If we're training something to run on, you know, an Amazon Web Services container, those cost money. And if you have a poorly designed code base that wastes resources, the client's like, hey, um, yeah, so we're running your code and now we have like a $2,000 bill for a month of use when we're expecting a $200 bill, that's a real world impact. And that's something that I, you know, you want to make sure you think about when you're kind of considering the problem and the constraints and requirements. Any questions on that? Just understand the problem. A lot of this is still a bit of common sense, you know, when you're thinking about problems, even in the real world, but there could be some, some, you know, more software specific uh, considerations. Um, moving to decomposition. So breaking down your complex problems into smaller problems. Um, that's something I can, I can show you here in a bit with our example. Uh, when you think about, you know, when you're, when you're trying to evaluate like this large piece of data and like, okay, so now, you know, I need to actually evaluate these smaller pieces and how am I going to write a function to do that? So that's exactly what you're doing. You're going to take your big problem and just break out the chunks and think about, okay, this problem, is this related to the other problem? Oh, it is. Okay. I'll kind of group these together. Um, you want to find your main components and then you want to kind of pr prioritize your sub problems. So, which one is going to provide the most impact to your client or to your, the, the problem you're trying to solve, right? If you're trying to build an e-commerce website, let's say you have a cool idea for selling, you know, pogs that we knew about in the nineties, right? You're trying to, you're trying to bring pogs back. Um, you know, if you want to get up and running fast, you know, do you, what do you focus on? Okay. I have a website. I want to sell some pogs. I have a big inventory of pogs. You know, what do I want to do first? Well, I want to, I want to be able to, have folks log in and see my inventory so they can buy it. Okay. So you want to probably focus on, you know, a presentation of inventory and then your shopping cart and working with a, a provider that gives you the, you know, the way to process credit cards. And, you know, you want to think about login, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to authenticate users where they can actually buy something? Uh, those are things to be thinking about. Um, and you want to prioritize them to where you can get up and running fast. Um, and of course, data. So data is, is of course, key. What kind of data are you going to use? What kind of data storage are you going to use? You know, you want to kind of sketch out your plan, a little diagram uh, to kind of see how your database looks compared to your code base, uh, compared to your front end where the customer is clicking buttons. You know, how are they talking to each other? You're going you're gonna to kind of sketch all that out. Um, luckily, in Code Platoon, they give you all those resources. Uh, you actually learn how to build full stack applications going from database all the way up to the front end, uh, right in the, the back end, the middleware. Uh, you learn all about those. And um, we have some pretty cool projects. If, if you haven't taken a look at some of the final projects on our U YouTube channel, you can take a look at the, like the, um, the graduation ceremonies where they present their projects. Um, there's some pretty cool ideas out there. Uh, in fact, uh, with my, I was in Lima platoon and we had this, like, we did a gardening app and we, one of our, one of our guys just said like, holy moly, like someone actually took that idea and actually turned it into something real. 
And, you know, we, we just did it for the assignment. Right. But someone actually took, you know, the idea, it was completely different, but it was the same type of idea of, you know, you know, taking someone who doesn't know anything about gardening and kind of automating, almost automating everything for them, like from planting seeds to, you know, cultivating and, and all those, all the other steps in between. So, um, but yeah, thinking about your data structures, how, how like, not just with like databases or how things are talking, but, you know, also, um, you know, how does a dictionary compare to a list? You know, which one will I want to use in my, in my script? When we think about, you know, using resources, you know, if, is it faster to, to iterate over this stuff or do I need to use like a hash table or more of a dictionary type structure? Uh, those things are important considerations when you're, when you're kind of developing your, your algorithm. And so um, with creating algorithms, we want to think about, you know, how we're going to use those to solve our sub problems. So we want to kind of just maybe do some pseudo coding. And so, or just like when we built our data flow processes, you know, using flow charts to kind of think about how our, our data is flowing in our code itself. Um, that's, that's important to, you know, thinking about problems and, you know, just computational thinking. Um, and so with that pseudo code, uh, you can just kind of, you know, especially with the smaller problems you're going to have here, you know, you know, you're going to be looking at doing something simple like, okay, take this string and, you know, maybe make every other letter capitalized. Well, how am I going to do that? How am I going to, you know, use the methods I learned and process a string? And then you'll kind of map out, you know, with pseudocode, okay, I want to loop over the stuff. And then, okay, I want to evaluate every letter and then run this method on that letter. And then, you know, if the word ends here and I have a space, then I need to make sure I kind of stop my flip-flopping so I'm not messing up the flow of how I'm switching capital and lowercase letters. Um, you'll be thinking about that. And so you can actually write pseudocode, you know, to kind of write your steps. And then when you actually get into coding, you take that pseudocode and you actually convert it into Python. And so, you want to write clean, modular, and readable code. Python's already readable, uh, and most likely you'll be writing Python that's readable. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think code that can be read by someone just new to Python is sometimes even better code than code that's more concise and harder to read. Um, there's a good example that uh, we have, uh, there's a site called Code Wars um, that you can get on. Well, Code Balloon has an organization in it and you can just do coding challenges with it. So you, you log in and you can go to these coding challenges and you know you can go to easy challenges or really hard challenges. And then like when you finish one, and th this is, always, I always write very simplistic code that's easy to read because that's just, I, I like to write code like that. I don't really, care for making it more concise. Um, but when I look at my solution and I see like what I did in 20 lines of code, someone else could write like two lines of code and do the same thing. It's like, well, which one's better? Like the one that's like a bunch of list comprehensions is very tiny space or one that's kind of written out kind of explains each variable and what it does. The runtime is probably the same for both, like for a very basic like loop or something. But um, you still want to, you know, you still want it to be readable. And so, you know, it doesn't hurt, like just because your code's long doesn't mean it doesn't run fast. So um, you, you want to focus on readability. Uh, modularity, uh, that means kind of breaking your code up into methods and functions or even different files, right? So if you have, you know, code for a certain thing, like your main script, and then you'll have like code that will convert things to other values or other, you know, um, other units. For example, let's say you have something that's converting feet to meters, right? You may have like a little function off the side in a, a utilities file that will do that. And so you'll just call that feet to meters function on whatever you want to convert. 
you don't want to have it just nested in your like for loop. You want to kind of separate it out. So that's what it means by modular. And then clean, of course, is just making sure your, your syntax is correct, making sure your variable names are clear, uh, stuff like that. So uh, here's what I was talking about, the print statements, right, for debugging and troubleshooting. So you want to apply those debugging techniques when you're writing code, you're going to run into errors. You're going to have exceptions pop up or errors, and that's okay. You're allowed to have errors. In fact, some of them are very, very helpful. So you want to use those print statements uh, in your code. So you just write some code, and then you're like, I really can't visualize what this, what this is doing with the string. Like, I, I don't understand how it's converting it into this dictionary or, you know, how, how am I converting all this, these three lists that I from these three lists and, and converting it to this dictionary that's, you know, how, how does that happen? You can write print statements in your function that's converting it uh, to kind of see what's happening. You'll just print out in the, in the console uh, whenever you're, whenever it's running. Usually it's going to run fast. So you'll kind of have to, you know, know when your code hits you'll put comments in your in your print statements. And I can show you kind of what that means here in a bit and what it looks like. Um, handle exceptions and errors gracefully. Uh, what that means is, well, when Python runs and it gives you an error, um, sometimes that error can be like presented and it may have some sort of weird cryptic statement. You can do, you can use blocks like try and accept where you want to try a block of code first, and then if it gives you error, you can have an accept statement that will raise an error that you can give a custom statement to where it kind of, it will, um, it will fail and give a little more information. Or you can have it like fail, but not like totally fail. You can kind of, you know, still go on, but you know, you'll have to handle something later. Uh, you can write Python code that does that. Um, and then of course documentation so we talked about comments right uh, comments are key to writing good code uh, when you're breaking down these problems and you're starting to write functions out you know you want to make sure you kind of write then and there when you write the function just write statements that tell you what it's doing right you may not have to write exactly what the parameters are right away but when, you, when you're writing the code to start doing like these loops that do stuff and change data from one form to another, you want to put a comment there like, hey, I'm taking this, you know, I'm taking this, uh, this, um, I'm taking this weather observation and I'm, I'm switching it, you know, I'm, I'm extracting the, the cloud conditions out of it and then I'm saving it to this dictionary. You can put a little comment in there kind of explaining what it's doing. Um, there's, there's things called doc strings on functions, uh, you'll see them when you look at some code uh, you know, on GitHub. If you start exploring code in GitHub, uh, different projects, you can take a look at their code base and you'll see like these triple quotes and like it has like a uh, summary and then it has you know, parameters, then it has returns. This just kind of shows you, hey, this, this function does this and then it takes in this and they're optional or they're, they're not optional, they're required. And then it should give you this, but sometimes it'll raise an error and it'll explain everything about that code. Um, those are important when you're writing functions. I didn't have a doctrine in here, right? Because this one here is pretty self-explanatory with the name, but I could put I could put a comment in here. Um, like for example, what does present mean? Like, um, you know, present is, so I can just say, you know, present is a Boolean that, will um, switch to true, true if name found. You know, you could put that in there if you want. Um, this one really doesn't need the comments, but uh, that's how you would, would put the comments in. And then the, the doc strings, I don't know if I have the doc string library here. They're gonna look like this. And so it'll look like the community. So I don't know what I did there. There we go. So it'll look like this. This function does blah. 
I don't know, say args. Um, typically it's gonna look like this. And it'll be a type, so it'll be a, this one will be a string. And it'll be a, the name you are searching for. And then you'll have input data. And this is a list. The list of students or whatever. like that. That's typically how doc screens will look. And this is nice, concise, you know, documentation of a function. This is a great way to kind of explain what a function does, kind of gives your arguments and then kind of what it returns. Um, and again, going back to the function again, it's a bit of review. This long string of data can be anything. It doesn't have to be this string. This is just what I define for this function. I can have a total other long string of data and just name it like long string of data two, and then feed it into the function and it will process that versus the first one. And so I haven't touched anything in the function. I've already written the function. I'm just changing my inputs to kind of do what I wanted to do. I want to know if this name is in my long string of data. This name again, could be 10,000 names long. I can't actually physically look at it. I need my program to do it for me. So documentation is key. Um, with that, collaborating is also off, is, is uh, awesome. I'm encouraging that from the very beginning with our Slack channel. I really, really, really would like to see like questions in the chat, you know, uh, especially this chat here or in Slack. If you have a question at two in the morning uh, because you're up and you want to you know, ask a question, that way you know what will be answered later, do it. You know, I don't, my site doesn't notify me when I'm sleeping, so I won't get it until I wake up, but you'll have a question out there. So um, when we're in Slack, just start, you know, spitting the questions out when you're going through problems. Uh, one limitation that is, uh, anything having to do with like the code platoon assessment or anything like that with the live coding uh, or the application assessment, uh, those kind of questions are off limits for the group. Uh, so you know, if you have any questions about it, you know, you can ask Guillermo, uh, me, um, and we can kind of help give you guidance. But yeah, don't be, don't share answers in the, in the chat on those things. So we want to keep those, those questions because uh, we're trying to measure your ability to, to, to take this information and then use it for the assessment. But yeah, um, feel free to post, you know, memes if you, if you have them. Um, you know, a lot of the channels do, especially in the, the main cohort, they actually make channels uh, for them. So uh, yeah, uh, I do I do like to see a pretty active chat. And if you have, if someone asks a question uh, and you know the answer, answer it. You know, don't be afraid to be wrong either um, because, you know, it, it's it's important to, to get those communications out there. Um, you won't be using Git here. We have GitHub, which is different from Git, but we do have version control systems that you'll want to use uh, to manage code. Um, and of course, in our chat, you know, we'll make sure we keep it collaborative and positive. Uh, but yeah, please, 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 like Slack is, is, is super important to use and getting that communication uh, underway. If you have a question, just, just spit out the questions. Uh, someone's going to have the same question as you in this class. Um, and if you've been coding a bit and you kind of understand some of it, you know, I encourage you to answer questions. So 
Uh, as far as optimization, you know, we want to analyze our code for, for, uh, for performance of bottlenecks. Um, this one won't really apply much to this. This is kind of more information for your purposes uh, later on when you're writing a bit more complex code. But uh, there are ways to profile code to identify how long it's running. You can time your code with a module. Um, and then, you know, you can, you can evaluate your code. Uh, and this kind of plays hand in hand with the next one, which is iteration refinement. Um, optimize your code and then uh, take a look at your time and memory efficiency. Uh, lastly, with the iteration and refinement, you know, we want to improve our solution. Um, that's the key. You'll learn about agile when you're in Coplatoon, but it's a, it's a way to develop software. Um, we always iterate over things. So we'll have a solution, then we'll go back and make it better, add more features. Um, that's a, that's a typical workflow. And then um, seeking feedback from peers. So every time we put code up, we want to push code to a code base. We get reviews. We have to get feedback. Uh, typically, code's not integrated into a main developed branch unless it's been reviewed and feedback's given and changes are made, and then it finally gets merged. So um, documentation is another piece of that, that that comments and doc strings. Documentation is like a readme, right? So I had a readme in you know, in this code base here, but it was, it didn't explain much, just kind of said, hey, go to the pre-course folder and take a look at it. But I did have like, hey, how you can, you know, see the material in this readme. So this is a, this is a bit of like a documentation piece here for this lesson. Any questions on the problem solving piece in computational thinking? Hopefully some concepts kind of stood out to you um, these are again, very general, but we'll use a lot of these when we're in the lessons and going over different data types and converting data types to other things and iterating over data. I have quite a few problems, uh, uh, nestled in these lessons that will really test your abilities. And, um, hopefully, you know, it gets you into that problem solving mindset and you start thinking about some of these things we're introducing. Uh, with that, it is eight o'clock. I want to go ahead and do a 10 minute break uh, just for bio break or anything. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording and then allow you to take a break. And then we'll be back at 810. Great. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody uh, from the break. Uh, we're going to continue on uh, before the break. Uh, we talked about the Python, uh, kind of the Python basics, uh, showed you some code, defined some functions uh, and some other keywords. And we went to problem solving. So uh, the problem solving steps you kind of think about as a, as a developer, as a coder. Um, and I have this little exercise here. Uh, again, this exercise isn't meant for you just to do because it's kind of already done for you. But this kind of thinks that this is a good like entry level problem to think about when you are, you know, you're given a problem and you have to figure out how to solve it. Okay. And this, in this case, the problem is in the paragraph below, write a script that identify the longest sentence by the word count. So we have a paragraph here and we could read it. We could read it and count each word if we want to, right? But we want our script to do that. That's the beauty of having computers is that they're fast. They're not necessarily, uh, you know, they don't think outside of what you've given it because they do exactly what you tell it to do. But if you can, if you're good at telling exactly what to do, then it'll do it beautifully. And that's, that's the key to writing good Python or good code in general. And so when we think about this, we can use our problem solving methods like, okay, how am I going to tackle this? This says, hey, in the paragraph below, write a script to identify the longest sentence by word count. Okay, so what do I have to do? What are my inputs? What are my outputs? Well, my input is uh, going to be the paragraph. So, so I want to have a paragraph as an input. And then um, what is my output? Well, my output says identify the longest sentence by word count. So probably the word count of the sentence and maybe the sentence itself as an example could be like my output. Um, and then, okay, so I want to go ahead and kind of you know, take the paragraph and define it. You know, we talked about variables. Here we want to identify our 
our paragraph as a variable. So this is a big string, the entire thing in one big string. It doesn't have to be in one line. I can, I can put it into a multi-line string. We'll talk about strings as data type later, but with the three quotes that allows you to put a single string into multiple lines. <clears throat> and then I'm like, okay, well, I want to identify the longest sentence. Well, then I need to think of a way for Python to take this paragraph and break it up into sentences. So how can I do that? How can I split up a paragraph into sentences? When, what am I gonna look for? Anyone? Yeah, we're gonna look for a period, right? We're gonna look for that, that dot. So we're gonna, we're gonna take our Python and scan this and find the dot. Say, okay, cool, I have a dot then what do I want to do with that dot? Well, I want to go ahead and kind of separate this from everything else, right? I want to separate each, each sentence from all the others. And so I'm going to have these sentences and I'm going, to, I'm going to split them. So this is one of those methods that I talked about, include methods. Specifically, this is a string method. If you look how it turns green there, and this actually, if you mouse over it, it kind of gives you an explanation of what it's doing, right? So it's say, I want to split this paragraph. So paragraph again is, is now a variable. Paragraph means that entire thing. I want to split it. Okay, so if I do that, right, I can go ahead and print sentences here. And what I'm going to do actually, I'm going to comment all this out. When I say comment out, I mean, I'm just going to highlight it and hit command or question mark, and that will comment all the code out. So now I can just run this as is to kind of see what it does. So if I run this, it gives me, now it has like the square bracket and I have these sentences and, the, and it looks like comma. So I have like this list of sentences all broken up. So, so cool. So I thought, I'm thinking about my problem. I'm like, okay, first I want to kind of break it up. And then, okay, cool. Now what I want to do, I have them all broken up. What do I do next? I have this list of sentences because I just printed out to kind of check how it looks, right? Now I want to, what do I want to do next after I have these sentences? Okay, so Michael says loop through them. Okay, so I can loop through them. So here I have this, uh, here I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm going to define this variable as long as sentence, but yeah, like I want to loop through them, but what do I want to do when I loop through them? What am I, what am I looking at? The word count in the sentence, in the sentences. Ah, okay. So, so find, found, find the word count. Okay. So how can I use Python to find the word count? So if I have a, a sentence here, let me find it. Here's a sentence right here. Right. So, um, let me go ahead and do it this way. So I have a sentence right here. Like, how do I find the word count with Python? What would I do? Like, I know we're probably going to loop over it. Well, how do I, I mean, right now it's just one thing, right? It's a list that has sentences. So this sentence is one thing in a list. How do I see each individual word using Python? Yeah, you look at the spaces, right? Or I could use the split method again. I was gonna say Sorry. that I'll look at the spaces plus one, would that be it? Yeah, you can use split uh, to kind of check white space. And I'll explain some of these methods. Again, this this part of the lesson isn't to kind of explain it, the inner workings of Python. It's just kind of thinking about the problem solving, right? So I want to loop over sentences. And here I'm saying for each sentence in sentences, uh, I'm going to start counting words. Well, I can't count words until I split this sentence into separate words. So I run the split method again, and that will split on, I want to split on white space. So here we have a space here, we're going to split that. And then um, I want to check, I want to check how long that list is, how many items that list compared to longest sentence, right? So if we think about how Python runs, right? If I look at the first sentence, right? I've gone down here, I've split my paragraph into sentences. I've made an empty string called longest sentence. So the first time this runs, right, it's gonna look at the first sentence. 
And then it's going to split it up into words. And so if we, if we count this, we can count it out, right? And it says, if the length of my sentence split is longer or bigger, so it's using the bigger symbol, is bigger than the length of longest sentence, well, then now I want to redefine longest sentence as my sentence plus a period. So the first time this loop runs, the first sentence is going to become the longest sentence because the first time it runs. And then it's going to go back, go to the next item in the list because we know sentences is a list. It's going to look at the next one and just compare the, that current sentence to the longest sentence. If it's longer, it redefines longest sentence as that sentence. So we're just going to look through. We're letting Python do all the work. Now, this is not how we would do it. Like, you know, especially with a shorter paragraph, we can kind of eyeball and find the longest word, right? Is this a perfect script? Will it find the longest sentence? Because it's going to go through and, you know, find each one and then finally print the longest sentence and then give us uh, the length of it. But let's go ahead and run it. So we run it. It says, okay, so now beyond its scenic landscapes, Washington's ecological, blah, 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 right? By the way, I use AI to build this, <laughs> this, uh, this paragraph, I was like, give me a quick paragraph about Washington State. And it gave me this, it was, it was great. Um, but so it finds, it finds the longest sentence, it gives me the count. Is this a perfect script? Do you think there's anything in here that may be not completely accurate? Going back to the problem solving, we've come up with a solution, but is this the right solution? Is this the right, the longest sentence? Is there anything that anybody can see in here that may cause a, a miscount or anything? The commas. What's that? The commas that are in the sentence, they they may not be seen as, uh, are, you know what? I'm unsure. It's going down a <laughs> red hole. No, it's fine. That's that's the way you think. You want to do the comma? The comma's going to affect anything. I see one with mountain with abbreviations. Ah, very good. So the AI prompt did not have that. I changed it, but yeah, here it's going to say, "Oh, this is a sentence," because it's going to split on that period, right? So that's that's the code is going to work, but is it right? Well, now this longer sentence is now split into two. It could be longer. In this case, I don't think it is longer. I think it's a shorter sentence, but that's something to think about. That's an edge case we want to think about when we're looking at a problem um, where when we run code, like, are we sure that's the right way? And we have a way to write code where we have tests to make sure that, you know, there's things running. But this is one of those edge cases. I kind of put that in there to kind of see like, okay, wow, well, this is a, a good first approach. This is probably not my final approach. And I want to go back and look at, you know, some edge cases, you know, depending, or if I'm evaluating, you know, I want this to work perfect. I'm writing a, if I'm evaluating an entire book or um, an article, if I want to find like the longest sentence in that, you know, to make sure you count for that. So, you know, we could write code in here, say, hey, if you see Mount, but it's like, you know, you have to kind of think about how it's written, like Mr., Mrs., all those different words that have a, uh, uh, a period at the end that don't mean the end of a sentence. We have to kind of think about this case and write code to ignore it, for example. So you can have like a list of all those, you know, abbreviations of um, words and say, if, if that is in there, you know, make sure you bypass that period. You know, you can, you can have code do that. You know, how do I do it? I have no idea. I haven't thought about it, but you know, we could pseudo code it out. Um, or you can and kind of come up with a good solution. So, but this is kind of a, a quick little, you know, problem solving exercise. This is exactly what we, you know, as, a, as we're looking at code, we have to think about how we're going to break things down and what tools are we going to use? And these, those tools I'm going to explain in this course. So um, I hope everyone liked that little thought exercise and kind of how we can break a problem down with Python, even though you probably don't know a lot of these things, you will at the end of this course, you'll know about split and then checking for length and these comparison operators and then concatenating sentences and all those things. So, um, you know, I'm gonna go back into like variables, right? We have, you know, hard coding versus programmatic coding. Um, you're gonna have a tendency to kind of hard code things. 
uh, when you start out in your in your development journey. Um, and that's when you type explicit values in your code. And sometimes we do have like hard code scenarios where we need to have it, but typically you want to avoid hard coding at all costs because you want to make sure that the the, the code operates on um, flexible data and it's, it's a flexible code. So we want to use variables and methods wherever we can without hard coding. Um, so our scripts are useful to others uh, and us when we're, when we're working with them. So uh, I have a bit of an example here for like, you know, if you want to write a Python script that will kind of plan the cost of a dinner uh, for a large group, you know, we have some code like this. We have, you know, our total dinner cost and we, you know, our customers say, hey, we're going to have a, a group of 50 people and we're going to have some options, right? We're going to have, we're going to have like dinner options. We're going to have like an appetizer and then we're going to have a main course, a dessert. And, the, you know, the, the appetizer will be $8. The main course will be 25 And, uh, and then, you know, we're going to have a, a $4 dessert. And then, you know, if people want to get like a, you know, a glass of wine or something, it'd be 10 bucks. And so you could write something like this and say, okay, well, I just need to put a math problem in here. So 50 times eight times 50 plus 50 times 25 plus 50. If you notice I'm hard coding all this thing, then what does this 50 mean? Because someone else who saw this, like totally across 50 times eight, and they'll have to kind of think, well, what does that mean? Like, is that a number of attendees? And then... And, you know, if we look here, we have number of diners, 50, and then cost of dinner. If we, if we ran this, we can get a, a nice cost. But this is a very flexible code. Um, what if the number changes to, you know, 65? Then we have to, okay, we'll have to change to 65 and so on. You know, here, 65, and then 65, and then 65. And then how many are... Having a, I'll say, thirty-two, or you know, going to get an alcoholic drink, and then here we have um, sixty-five, and then I can, I can run that. Okay, cool. Like this is really doing nothing. This is just printing out the <laughs> number sixty-five with the number of diners. It's just you know, I'm just putting a comment. So I'm printing two things out like together. You can do that with print statements. So you can have a, you, know, uh, you can have a um, several arguments and it'll just print them out in order. And then here, this is just printing out the result of this simple arithmetic. And so like, you wanna make sure you have to change the code in each location and it can be kind of hard to do, you know? If that's easy here, I mean, I can, I can make sure I hit every single one of them here, but you know, what if, like, what if, uh, there were several places this code was used or um, what if there were like several dinner options and like only half people are using one dinner option versus another. And you have to kind of do the math. and can figure out how, how am I going to divide? You know, there's like four different options and I have 10 people, this one, I have 20 and this one. And so it can be very difficult if you're hard coding things. And so you want to kind of turn everything into a variable so you don't have to worry about it. So these are the questions you kind of want to think about. Like, okay, well, what if another number in the calculation was the same as the number of attendees? Like, what if you get 50 times 50? Like, what does that wage 50 mean? Uh, what if you change the wrong one? You know, does that affect anything? Um, how can we organize the data differently? So you want to start, you know, identifying variables uh, when you can. And so here in this example, we have, uh, we, we changed the number of diners to 61. And we actually define it as a variable now. So we didn't have it as a variable before, we just had the number 65. Now we have number of diners 61, and now we want to specify how many people are going to take the alcoholic option. So we have 20. We can just change it right here. And then we don't change it anywhere else, we change it right there. And then now we can start calculating costs here. So now we say, well, appetizer is now equal to number of diners times eight. And so, you want to change the price of your appetizer? Change it here. You know, you can even make that a variable if you want, but you can also say, well, if I want to change the number of diners, just change it right here. It's one line, line one. That's where we change it. And then main course, same thing. We're taking num diners, and it's a very descriptive variable name, number of diners, right? And we're just multiplying it by these figures. And then we're just say total dinner cost is 
these variables defined from these mathematical functions. So by the time we get down to like the final part of code, there's no numbers at all. It's just variables being calculated together. And then we can plug it in. Number of diners, 61. And if we have 65, we can quickly change it. Change the alcoholic option, they'll change the cost. So which one would you use if this was just a small portion of a larger code base that maybe calculate dinner costs uh, per week over several venues? So now we have like this code being used to like average things. You wanna make sure it's easily changed. Um, so the actual like core, these core calculations don't get changed. You just, you don't want to change like the price. You want to keep that fixed, but if you want to change the number of diamonds, you can. And you only have to change it once. And you know you hit it everywhere in the code base if you change it right here. You know, I'll have to change it once versus one, two, three, four times. You change it once. So if you need to upscale quickly, you can. 650. How much does it cost? 24,000. So. Those variables limited problem. Any questions on these exercises or kind of thinking about the, the, the computational, you know, thinking process? Okay. That's the end of the lesson. So here we learned some basic Python concepts uh, to know like the vocabulary, uh, those foundational pieces. Uh, it's good to kind of just com commit those memory if you can, just kind of what they mean. Um, and you learn some problem solving strategies and kind of that computational thinking process that we have uh, when we're writing code. Uh, these skills um, are useful for tackling these problems. Uh, you know, you're going to you're going to come up with, you know, on the job, I think about processing strings uh, and then, you know, iterating over lists, turning them into dictionaries using those dictionaries to count things. Uh, I do that on the job. These very basic things you're learning this course, I do part of my job every day. And um, so it's it's really important to you know learn this stuff. And then as you use it more and more, it becomes second nature to you. So um, any questions over anything in the lesson content? And lastly, is anybody having any issues with um, getting like a Jupyter Notebook started, whether on GitHub code spaces or um, locally? Uh, if you want me, if you want me to show you another way of like getting Jupyter to run, if you're a little more, you know, uh, savvy with like a command line, I can show you another way to get Jupyter Notebooks to run uh, in your browser, which is nice locally. Well, I missed the whole first two hours. So I, I missed all that. <laughs> okay. I didn't really go over anything. So in that, I didn't go over in the pre-course, like the pre-course notebook. If you take a look at that, um, I just quickly like showed it, but again, okay. it's meant to kind of read on your own time, but it has a, a lot of resources you can use. Um, yeah, so these assignments uh, down here, uh, these are links to Replit. They're just like uh, they're just like little practice problems you can do. You don't have to complete them. Um, they will take you Replit. So if you click on it, it'll open up uh, Replit for you. I'm gonna pull it up now so you can see. Um, so let's see. Answers. Okay. So I can't explain this exercise to you because this one kind of takes what I taught a bit and goes kind of extreme with it. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. So there's really, I don't have any documentation up for that. But um, basically, when you fork something over, 
Uh, let me see if I can even, I don't know if I can log in or not. I think I have, did I tie it to GitHub? I may have. Uh, sure. Ah, okay. Is it this one? Um, yeah, we'll use my personal one. Let's see. Okay. And so if you, okay, decide to go to light mode for whatever reason. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you go here, uh, what you're doing is when you fork it, it's taking it from the seat, the code platoon, and it's putting it to your personal, your personal uh, Repl.it account, where then you can actually edit it. So right now you can't edit it, you have to fork it. And so um, if you fork it here, go fork it, and then it'll say, hey, this is your workspace. Now, now I have it. Um, now I have it in my own Repl.it. See, I came up with my picture now. Um, now I can run this and do things with it. And so you just can't run it from like the code platoon side. You have to kind of fork it over to run it. And again, these are exercises for your own time. So if you take a look here, um, we learned about this keyword import. So it says answers, right? Answers isn't in the library this time though. It's actually another Python file. So you would, you would import, if you take a look here, it's saying from the answers file, import answers the variable. So here the variable is this long list of stuff. And those are the answers to the problems uh, right here. And so it says, hey, write a variable named fruits holding a list of the following values, apples, oranges, grapes, pears, okay? So say, hey, write a variable, okay, holding a list. Well, we haven't learned about lists. Again, you can look ahead and kind of see what they are. But here we have um, uh, apples, oranges, grape, pears. Looks like it gave me a little preview of the the answers. Okay, and so how this is how this is working is um, it's giving us a task and it's all commented out, right? Um, then it's giving us an assertion, which what it what it's what what that means is it's kind of comparing our answer to what we just defined. So in this case, if you look here, what we really did when we provide an answer is we provided a list. We defined fruits as a list. And then what this is doing is it's saying, hey, does fruits actually equals answers at the index of zero in answers.py? So does my first one, is it does it answer that right there? And so if I comment everything else out here, when I say comment out, what I'm doing is I'm turning it all into comments so it doesn't run uh, because you're gonna get some failures. So I just like to comment everything else out. Um, and I'll explain how I just did that in a second. Now, if I if I run this, it says test case pass one true. That's good. It means it passed. It's true. If I did not have the same, if I had, if I had, if I had great and try to run that, now it's false because I don't have grapes. I have grape. So I need to make it plural to actually make it pass. And then you can just, you can uncomment, uh, and I uncomment by using command question mark um, on the keyboard, uh, like that. Um, or you can just go to the front of a line and type a uh, the, the pound sign. So here it's kind of, I don't know why it's giving me hints. I think these are like AI hints. Uh, you could probably turn those off, actually. I yeah. don't know where the setting, actually, where the Aaron, setting on is. Actually, on the right side in tools, um, if you scroll down, you'll see user settings. And then you can turn off the uh, the different uh, 
AI autocomplete stuff. Oh, like right here? Yep. So, okay. uh, so you know, so if you scroll down to uh, user settings. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I don't really care for, I, I, I don't care for Replit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, down you'll see like um, AI user um, code completion, you turn, you turn that off. Then maybe also code intelligence, turn that off because that will kind of give you hints and you don't want hints yeah. at this stage right now, so. No, yeah, so if you're using Replit, turn that off, go into tools and turn it off. I think that's better. Yeah, that's much better. So, but yeah, so this this one here, that's exactly what you're doing. Um, again, uh, if it's confusing for you, don't worry about it because we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at these, um, but you'll be able to solve all of these by the time you finish the course. So um, if you have questions on these exercises in the chat, ask away. These are meant for you guys to discuss and talk about, you know, you know, help each other come up with answers. That's what I want this chat in the, in the Slack channel for. So all these assignments in the bottom that I have that I may need to actually refactor because I don't know if I looked at all of them. Um, but uh, if they're confusing for you, you know, you can ask, hey, anybody else figure out this one out? Like, what, what, how can I approach this a different way? Uh, you can totally do that. Did that help, uh, Jose? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Yep, you're welcome. Cool, so yeah, data type practice, oh, no. first and last name uh, is the other one. Oh, I'm sorry, do we have a question? Yeah, I have a question just about this um, this this practice problem. Can lists be commaed out? As in, you've got the brackets and then a comma and then another set of lists. Does it does it work or no? Uh, let me see. Hold on. Uh, I'll just make a code here. So it's you're like, saying you have a a list, right? Right, because there's like different test cases. So I'm not sure if um, I'm kind of curious if like. Cause it's going to keep going back to fruits regardless and like reading it. So I don't, I don't know if it can, if you can just like separate the individual lists by a comma and then um, it'll actually pass all three assertions or something. Oh, so you're talking about just the, all three. Okay. So we are saying, uh, okay, it so, ever. so we add new fruit, right? So let's go ahead and just copy this one here. Uh, actually we can just say fruits dot append um kiwi right yeah okay that's what i was thinking about that as well just you know yeah again i think this is it's one i meant to refactor but we can still we can still use it right so um you haven't learned about list methods yet so doing this uh will be kind of hard but it doesn't mean you can't look up how to add like you could totally google like how do i add something to a list like that is 80 percent of my job is Googling things and reading. So um, you'll find that uh, to be a big part of the job and big part of this course is like, how do I do that? And so you can just ask Google, you become a professional Googler. So um, let me see here. Oh yes, Victoria, the, you know, the coding challenges. Um, are you talking about the, the coding challenges here at the bottom of the lesson or the coding challenges like the uh, the application coding assessment? I think it's the coder byte challenges. Oh yeah, yeah, the coder byte challenges. Um, again, we can't talk about like the content of those. Yeah, those are the, the, you'll get those in the email whenever you do the part one of the application. I may need to switch my audio. Yeah, I bought a new I bought a new Mac Mini, and Mac Minis don't have microphones or anything, and I don't have a microphone <laughs> yet, so I'm using my AirPods right now. Um, but yeah, so when you add the stuff in here to these uh, these tasks, um. Whenever you uncomment them and run them, if you did it right, it'll just tell you all of them that passed. Um, I know if you don't, if you if you 
leave them empty, you may get some errors. So you want to make sure you just comment them out. It makes it easier to kind of keep track of what you're doing. So. Uh, the coder byte challenges I think are in JavaScript and Python, but I would, I would do them in Python um, since you're learning that with quick pass. As far as writing for my job, um, quite a bit when I'm writing documentation. So, um, cause I'll write like a total, like big readme files and, you know, we have a template. So we have a, a like a, a, a shelled out version of a template. And then I have something to fill each section in, but, um, I'm in a research division right now for like, we're doing machine learning models for weather forecasting. And so it's a lot of documentation because it's, you know, we're taking stuff from academia that have like the MIT licenses, and then we're converting it into like, we're converting these models into APIs and that can be used to help weather models like do better. So it's really, it's a really cool, it's like a really cool job actually, I love it. Um, it's uh, definitely challenging though. It's you know, learning about machine learning. I don't know the ins and outs of the actual like machine learning algorithms because they're, they get really in depth into like taking multi-dimensional like lists, these giant files, like these, these some of these files are, are like seven, eight, 10 gigs in size and like converting them, so. Um, so for the Jupyter Notebooks, you don't have to fork anything. Uh, you can um, you can just copy the files from GitHub and then you can you can make like a GitHub code space. Um, you can, if you already have a Git, like a GitHub account, you can fork it over and then mess with it on your own. But you can download each individual file and then open it with uh, you know, Jupyter or with VS Code uh, or if you're on code spaces, you can drag it into the code spaces window and uh, work on it there. So you don't have to fork it over, but you can if you want to. Um, I'm going to stop the recording because I don't want to lose my audio. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording here, but I'll keep going.